Greetings. Good morning and good afternoon for some of us. Uh, and welcome. We're so happy to be here. My name is Jamie Ann Jacobin. I'm the Executive Director of the James Fremick Alliance for Craft. If you're unfamiliar with our organization, we are really dedicated to fostering appreciation, education, and connoisseurship of American craft. Of course, you're here on a special event, a special day uh, to honor our 2021 Masters of the Medium. And with that, I would like to invite our president of JRA Craft, JG Harrington, to act as our moderator and introduce our very special Masters of the Medium. JG. Thanks, Jamie Ann. I'll start with a bit of housekeeping. First, closed captioning is available during today's talk and can be activated at the bottom of your screen. Also, we'll be hearing from each of our panelists and then we'll have a question period. If you'd like to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box. You can do that at any time. We will keep track of the questions during the program. I also wanted to mention that we are now completing a fundraising campaign to support acquisitions at the Renwick Gallery for its 50th anniversary. Right now, we're just $3,500 from our weekend goal, and we just need a few more contributions to get there. Every dime contributed to the campaign will support acquisitions, and any contribution is greatly appreciated. If you're interested, you can click on the link in the chat to learn more. And now to the program. I'm thrilled to be moderating the JRA Craft Symposium, featuring this year's winners of our Master of the Medium Award. Each of our panelists today is consummately skilled but more significant, they use those skills to tell important stories. These stories enlighten us, broaden our perspectives, and challenge us to better understand the world around us and our roles in making it a better place. As moderator for such a distinguished panel, my role is to make sure you hear as much from them as possible, so I'm going to introduce them briefly. But if you want to read about all of their accomplishments, and you should, you can see their full bios at the link that's going to be posted in the chat. Our first panelist today is David Harper Clements, this year's Master of the Medium for Metal. From 2009 to 2018, he taught metalsmithing at the University of Arkansas, founding the metalsmithing department and leading it for eight years. And he is now an independent artist and workshop instructor. He embraces the craft of metalworking and its history of techniques and objects. His practice covers a wide range, communicating ideas about identity and narrative, along with social commentary, but also focusing on material and process-based work. His work is widely exhibited, appearing in nine shows in 2019 and 2020 alone. In addition, he recently was featured in the Cut the Craft podcast. Here is David Harper Clements. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for uh participating and uh, coming to view this. I'm truly honored to be uh, a member of the recipients this year. Um, it's an esteemed group of amazing artists and, uh, you know, we'll always continue to explore through my craft. Um, with that, uh, you can go ahead and we'll begin my presentation and I hope that you enjoy it. As an artist, I've always seen making as an act of knowing. It is a process based on sitting in a creative space, a space of invigoration and toil to find connection and understanding with the world around me through the media and ideas I work with. I feel fortunate to have had a great role model for being a craftsperson. My grandfather's life carving custom gun stocks let me know that making is a worthwhile and powerful endeavor with the capacity for communication and appreciation of function, beauty, and ideas. Early support from my family to pursue art was invaluable. Initially, my background as an artist focused on painting and drawing to tell stories through images. I moved away from painting and drawing, compelled to make three-dimensional objects using metalsmithing as my primary artistic medium to convey narrative and explore the interplay of varied materials. An interest in making social commentary based work started in grad school and has continued to this day. My social commentary based work is informed by my observations of historic and contemporary mass media, pop culture, work by other artists, and personal experiences. The resulting work is ever evolving and reflective, 
seeking to discuss the ideas connected to identity construction, overlooked populations in society, and other societal ills that draw my attention. Frequently, I use and refer to commonplace utilitarian objects as a point of access with my audience. An understanding of a teapot, cup, or utensil directs the viewer to reconcile and seek to understand the way it has been altered. The alteration becomes the message. The trees we construct was created in response to the poem Strange Fruit by Abel Maripol. The poem vacillates back and forth between images of beauty with those of horrific lynching. The work is intended to reference the various societal institutions that use rhetoric to create a guise or facade of normalcy, allowing us to justify terrible actions against something defined as other. Palliative Measures continues to explore the ideas presented in the trees we construct. The exterior is intended to be seductive and lure the viewer. It is a polished facade of refinement and class that bears sinister contents. The suggestion is that the content would taint the drink's palliative effects, leaving an emotionally and psychologically bitter residue to contend with. It is a balance of pleasure and recognition of pain. The overlooked breadbasket has details connected to the act of lawn care, specifically raking leaves. The piece was inspired by a conversation with a neighbor. The neighbor let me know that I could borrow her Mexican if I felt I could not keep up with the yard work at my home. The weekly work of her lawn worker was not appreciated for the sacrifice provided for her aesthetic pleasure. The basket and bread service are intended to reference the sacrifice of the individual to sustain the quality of life of a patron and the general public. The weight of deferred gratification is intended to consider food sustainability in, amidst a significant environmental change. The work is a survival kit of sorts, containing the necessary basic elements for sustenance. The trick is that the component seeds, corn, wild rice, and wheat must be nurtured to maturity and then processed for proper consumption. The necessity of having to engage in all of the steps leading to the consumption is the meditation on deferred gratification offered by the piece. Upcycle Flatware Set was inspired by watching a homeless man convert his cardboard begging sign into an eating surface upon which he carefully arranged the food given to him. Despite experiencing homelessness, he exhibited dignity and appreciation of the aesthetic and sensual pleasure of the simple experience of eating. For these utensils, the cardboard is elevated to a higher intrinsic value by its transformation into cast silver. The cardboard patterned handle is intended to emphasize stratification and class structure, where you constantly are reminded of the status required to own and use such a utensil. This work continues to explore identity, but does so in a more cryptic language. In an attempt to understand things that make us feel uncomfortable, an organic form is used as a surrogate for the self. The work hinges on the interplay between an organic form and the device probing or containing that form. This work was inspired by my long-standing fascination with Victorian-era medical and scientific devices and equipment, like prosthetics, ear trumpets, and septum adjusters. Objects from this era have a wonderful combination of beauty through extraneous ornamentation and crude functionality. The resulting works are detailed fabrications designed to suggest proposed, non-existent, but seemingly plausible truths or functions. I try to play upon a familiarity with the methods in which my audience has interfaced with similar objects or tools of inspection. The design of the device is intended to yield information on how the tool is to be used without direct information or instructions. In the case of these devices, you look into the oculus or through an opening to observe the interior of the organic specimen. If I should fall from such a great height, please collect my pieces, is an installation of nine wall-hung specimens. This work embodies personal narrative exploring thoughts on being disconnected and seemingly dropped to plummet to earth in a new and strange place. Each specimen is a collected sample being displayed and studied to discover the organ of discontent. 
The works are intended to elicit a dynamic push and pull of repulsion and attraction, finding the beauty in the absurd and grotesque. The organic form is presented for display and examination both within the structure of the brooch and the pinned location on the body of the wearer. The organic form appears to change color to indicate a biological response to the invasive probe extending from the brooch rim. Much of my formal jewelry work is driven by my curious eye. This work tries to organize and harness many visual references to similar aesthetics and diverse materials and their physical properties. I move fluidly among the varied jewelry formats, pushing to tease out the truest voice of the materials and techniques being used. What are they asking to become? The effects of natural weathering are transformative. The unexpected results of sun blistering, wind scouring, eroding, layering, repetition, and unexpected mergings are the guiding principles observed and then employed in this grouping of work. Found shards are often collected as I make my way through my surroundings. They eventually are paired with other found or fabricated materials. The task becomes making the components seem as though their combination is logical like the suggested splinting of this fragment of bone. Bone in its rich diversity of surfaces, silky smoothness, crinkled undulations, and pithy porosities is a recurring material appearing in my work. Here it is combined with sterling silver and repurposed mild steel leaf samples from the J.G. Braun Company. The presence of hollow spaces offer opportunities to consider relationships of interior and exterior and pique the curiosity of the viewer to more closely examine the pieces. Often, I find myself drawn to a particular form. That single form will give rise to numerous pieces as it is reiterated with different material combinations to evoke different sensations. Seen here are combinations of wood and sterling silver. An organization of chaos appears in many of the pieces as multiple irregular elements are collected into cohesive singular forms. The collected elements and their processes of binding are emphasized as a design feature. Being able to explore varied materials, their properties, and the associations we assign these materials provide me with an endless well of curiosity to fuel projects. The repetition of the cluster and the suggestion of contained space are present in the steel and glass sculptural piece, the pearl, wood, and silver brooch, and the silver and citrine ring. The respective combined materials direct attention at actual and suggested relationships between strength and frailty, valuable and inexpensive, or notions of protection found within all three pieces. Most of my jewelry seeks to choreograph the use of surface, pattern, and luster of material on both the front and the back of the pieces. Doing so reinforces an awareness of the dynamic of public and private related to jewelry. I want there to be an element of the work that only the wearer is conscious of and can share if they desire to. This necklace started by focusing on specific inherent properties of the component materials. The low melting point of pewter and the higher combustion temperature of the wood allow for the connection method of the two materials in this neck piece. Molten pewter is cast directly against the cut jagged edge in the wood. Once the metal cools, the materials are connected permanently. This grouping of work is based on a personal narrative exploring the shifts that take place in your understanding of self at different stages of life. The exploration looks at the struggle to reconcile a disconnect between the reality of your present existence with how you identify yourself. The project evolved from a short story centered around a character forming a crude boat and setting adrift to escape captivity. Unbeknownst to the character, the boat has a stowaway and the voyage ends badly. While preparing illustrations for the story, I found myself pulled to make objects that are abstractions of images from the story. The work in this series has a nautical theme. 
forms reminiscent of boats, buoys, and debris fields are recurring visual elements within the jewelry pieces. Display props for this body of work and others I have executed will aesthetically connect to the objects but exist primarily as secondary support structures. The structures designate an environment for the piece to inhabit and individuate the work in an exhibition space. Within the story, unheeded warning signs are present and foreshadow the demise of the craft. Warning buoy brooches and necklaces form symbolic references to warning signs presented in the story. Compartments in some of the pieces reference the stowaway. Seemingly, and in the case of this brooch, concealed from view. The pieces have a progression that follows the events of the text Boat forms become obliterated into fragments and shards in a debris field. Utilitarian objects offer a direct connection with an individual to shape their experience of some everyday task. My goal is to create visually intriguing objects that emphasize the myriad of pleasurable, subtle actions and sensations related to experiencing the use of the objects. It's like the difference between feeling the rain and just getting wet. Each metal offers and requires unique working properties and value associations. Ductility, malleability, hardness, and luster are choreographed differently using varied metals in my housewares. Pewter is a wonderful material to use for housewares. It is very responsive to forming and texturing techniques and easily castable. Graphic textures are frequently used on the works to impel people to handle the item. All of the formal and material curiosities present in my other work also appear in my functional wares. Bone, eggshell, and altered wood are frequently present to provide warm, earthy counterpoints to the brushed, satiny luster of the pewter. I'm constantly trying to find ways to have the multiple tools in a set integrate with each other in a seamless, visually cohesive manner that enhances the overall functionality of the item. Variation within repetition of a format helped to maintain my interest as a maker and allow me to move through numerous visual languages. Angular facets, fluid ripples, and peculiar surprises are features inviting investigation by a user through interaction with these cups. I enjoy tapping into the vast history of utensils for service and consumption. As in this pewter salad service set and other utensils, I try to reinterpret the tools using my aesthetic sensibilities. Dessert utensils like this etched brass cake set or these brass and wood coffee scoops are only some of the many implements for serving and consumption. The variety are a rich playground for inquiry. I am thrilled to investigate historic formats that combine a ritualized use with intricate ornamentation. This absinthe spoon has pierced pattern work reflecting some of the botanicals used in making the beverage. Objects like ladles present an opportunity to apply forging at a larger scale for utensils, but I continue to highlight small scale details within the execution. Steel is a material that speaks through my body in a different way than the non-ferrous metals. Steel shaping and assembly requires more indirect work mediated by tools to handle working the metal when it is hot. The material is ideally suited for tools of preparation or service. Despite the different methods necessary for steel work, I try to impart the same sensitivity and finesse I use with my jewelry. Aesthetic trends seen in other bodies of work are present here in the combination of steel and wood within the steel fruit bowl. The sconce and other lighting formats offer an opportunity to orchestrate the dynamic relationship of metal's solidity 
with the immateriality of light. Shadow and projected color are the artifacts of this oppositional material interplay. These past two years have been disorienting, to say the least. I find myself searching for an escape, looking for something that I can control and find solace in. Lately, drawings made from my surroundings and idea sketches provide a needed slowing and forced meditation. The drawing space gives me a place to internalize, digest, and grow from the last two years. It's a simple act, but one that lets me direct my anxiety in a productive direction, yielding clarity to move forward with new creative endeavors. I am often asked how to bring more voices to the dialogue and practice of craft, specifically minority voices. What will you do to create early or first exposure to craft? What will you do to sustain exposure and promote knowledge acquisition within a discipline? What will you do to foster validation and support the sustained practice of a discipline? The answers to these questions have brought me to where I am and I feel have some universal application. These questions are guides for the self as well as directives for enriching the creative lives of many by introducing them to some type of making. Do what you can, however you can, in your sphere of influence to answer these questions. Humanity will be bettered by the collective endeavor. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation of the varied directions within my work. Thank you for your interest and support. More of my work and process can be found on my website and Instagram. Thank you, David. Our next panelist is Sergei Isipov, this year's Master of the Medium for Ceramics. His work is sculptural and painterly, surreal and narrative, often featuring animal-human hybrids or presenting different parts of the story on the front and back of a piece. At base, his work is about human relationships and the implied universal nature of expression, but ultimately is intended to be interpreted in light of the viewer's personal experience. His work is collected and shown widely, including a retrospective in 2017 at the Erie Art Museum and a solo exhibition in 2019 at the Russian Museum of Art in Minneapolis. In 2021, his work was included in an exhibition at the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento and in the Macau International Art Biennale. Here is Sergei Isipov. Hi, everybody. Well, thank you so much for getting this award. I'm really excited to receive it. I always wanted to be an um, artist, and I'm surprised i become a master of this field, too. And this definitely helped me to be more, be more expressive. Thank you. I probably need to start from mention um, how I, where I grew up and how I become an artist. So my parents both were uh, artists. And I grew up in uh, Ukraine, and this is where I first go to art school in age of 11, study for painting for seven years. And later, after I graduated the school, I moved to Estonia, a small country on the Baltic Sea. It's still been part of Soviet Union, but this has uh, been really good uh, university where I study ceramic for six years. Um, Education been really classical, study material, history, and I possible to mention, uh, probably say it, this is my education been really in a classical training. And um, I moved to United States in 1993. And first my six years, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. And it's been a little bit accidental move to US. I'm not really been ready or really want to but happen to be life bring me to united states where i try to make career right now i live uh, at this uh, slides what you see this is where i live right now it's a beautiful place it's really um, easy to work <laughs> because no distractions and uh, i spend a lot of times in the studio and with my family um <clears throat> and my first uh, experience uh in us to make art being um, try to figure out what what actually people like to see and i noticed this really like it animals 
and really like a lot of colors. And it's been really easy to express myself in this way. And I'm really start exploring uh, language, culture, and um, art, um, how their, uh, all the system works and run. It's been really interesting discovery and challenge for me like artist. And my first big exposure like a uh, uh, artist being in um, uh, Smithsonian art craft show um, where I actually get uh, price best of show there's been like really big revelations to see myself uh, surrounding other artists and I noticed my experience with painting and uh, ceramic education give me big advantage um, in the way where I able to uh, not really be stopped by um, um, material. So been really free to explore uh, this field of three-dimensional art. Um, and I remember I just jumped from one side to other this big benefit actually be foreigner i noticed because you always have like a lot of excuses to why you do this way because it's not my culture not my language even my parents not live in this country it's give <laughs> a lot of freedom so this has been really uplifting to see how my art move in a kind of let's say in in weird way i still produce uh, objects but there really no clear um sense what for just how i feel this is what i uh, am making and and uh, a lot of times in the beginning i've been um uh, in the, i've been um controlled by a uh, situation of what studio I have and what kilns I have. Just limits of sizes give me like size of kiln. Um, and later in my career I move in a new field with bigger kilns and I'm able to explore in different dimensions too. And it's really been challenge or interesting way to see how I able to express myself in the clay and I noticed combination of painting on the form being such expressive things and I really like it in the, the three-dimensional work that you always have other side what hidden from your eyes in the beginning so to see all all work uh, you need to look at from each side so Maybe in one side there's be one story and in the back of the same work be a different story or some sort of involvement beginning of in the end. So it's uh, even my work being really narrative enough, this is a three-dimensional form give me even more be exploring a narrative side of uh, um, of uh, expression um, and I start get like a more involved with different museums and big shows and I feel like I need to move in the larger sizes so this has been my um, uh, way to move to bigger form and I start making these portraits what I feel uh, there's so narrative already. This face have such a narrative uh, uh, expression. <laughs> I even laughing all the time in our passport. We only have a picture of our face, not all our figure. So how 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 informational informational this face uh, possibly be? Uh, yeah, like a form. Mm -hmm. And so, but in some way, even flat surface of face not being enough, I start kind of decorate them in some sort of tattoos. 
Mm. And um, it's interesting challenge how to, uh, to move from 2D to 3D. And I explore this possibility or I feel like this enrich uh, me if once in a while I made two dimensional drawings and they give me sense why in a ceramic or a, in a three dimensional form so much uh, more able to express yourself and so much complicated because you needs to be engineer, designer, um, storyteller, and craftsman. So it's so many different fields. For example, it's the same um, idea in a 2D and 3D and see in a 3D this form even much more rich because you have uh, other side. A lot of times I painting bottom too. So even bottom sometimes are able to be so uh, narratively rich. Um, and uh, 2010, uh, my life changed because I become a father. <laughs> and it, interesting how, like, around my apartment where I live, there suddenly gets so many kids' toys. And I realized first time <laughs> how interesting field uh, all these uh, kids' toys. Um, and they're so cute and even squeaky, <laughs> not breakable. So unconsciously, I start to compete with this uh, uh, kids toys. And this is one sculpture from this period of uh, time. Yeah, um, maybe a part of me be European has really <laughs> big part of uh, how you able to express yourself on an, in a narrative side. Um, I all the time joking, uh, if you ask, uh, say, Russian, how are you? This will always be answered for a long time and only bad things. <laughs> so in America, if you ask somebody, how are you? This always like good things. <laughs> and always like, yes, fine. This never have more details but it's always good stories. So I don't know how my work sometimes too pushy on the narrative side, but this is, uh, I guess, who I am. Um, if I have chance to work in Europe, I really like to do because it's a different way of, um, of work. If in America, I'm working a lot with uh, consumption. I, for some specific show or specific sale or specific commission. So in, uh, if I do show in Estonia, this is only, only for friends. There's not much market for art, and, but to give in some way freedom to do anything, you don't need to stuck with your, um, recognition and you're able to explore different fields and uh, this is one uh, this group of pictures from the show what i made in estonia it in uh, wood firing a technique and with painting on the wall so hand ceramic uh, objects on the wall and all the rest of things painting around and um yes and sizes it's really interesting to see how, um, how in the time of your career, you be demanded from you be larger. If you become more successful or bigger artist, you feel like your art needs to be bigger. But I'm still confused and not sure how this really necessary for like, specific like for be who you are that's a really good challenge but at the same time i feel like making bigger work let's take more more time and more physical work and plus you need to deal with this uh, packaging uh, shipping and all this stuff what a smaller size really helped me express uh faster and more efficient um uh, but but 
view that's a big deal like for example this work what you see it's hard to tell it's small or big because there's so much information already but if i made this size of uh, you know small building this work it's take me maybe year but um if this be size um, like uh like uh, uh smaller form it's take me make maybe a week so and I make able to make much more work but anyway that's once in a while this interesting challenge make something big I noticed that I all the time jump I, every time I made something large I move to small work after this and after I made something small this is so much less satisfaction in the end I not see I make something like important so I move to bigger uh, sizes and this is the same piece from other side again this really fascinated me this idea you have view I noticed this best solution uh, to make large piece made like for a specific place and I made the uh, first uh, this large fire sculpture but um, in North Carolina it's a big performance piece but they live after uh, performance done um, and this is how this work looks like in the process for performance because you're firing to really high temperature and their uh, kilns open up and you see work in this heat and fire process maybe five minutes and you close it back and later you get uh, um, totally fine work next day and usually this works for park a couple like a larger pieces for uh, exhibition in Erie Art Museum I made and this is how they've been looks like in all uh, together view and I'm explore a two collection of my old work and made new work I noticed for art it's become really important to have installation and even I think physically each work it's a totally small complete universe but how you put them together become effective for viewer so sometimes you need to come out with idea of installation I really like this thing it's like a fashion show they're all come in different costumes but perfect for Holly <laughs> I really need to mention how um, um, I'm working uh, with family and this is my daughter artwork and she big influence to my work and my life and she's really talented kid and I really try to inspire her to uh, be uh, creative but sometimes hard because kids want to just to play I would like to she play in art but this needs to uh, take time and I work, and this is my wife, Kadri Pernametz, and she's working in our studio. We share the same idea about uh, art, and this is her work for um, Alan, Alice in Wonderland, what happened in uh, uh, Denmark, one of this piece. But <laughs> cheapest and uh, best material for be creative at snow, and we have plenty where I live, and this is we explore to make experiments what nice need to do need to be fired and every year you possibly build new and new thank you thank you sergey our next panelist is wendy maruyama this year's master of the medium for wood she's a highly skilled furniture maker and his work is exhibited all the time including in the current show shadows from the past sansei artists and the american concentration camps at the Monterey Museum of Art. She's a longtime teacher and the winner of JRI Crafts Distinguished Craft Educator Award in 2012. Her practice has moved well beyond furniture though. 
The TAG project, which grew out of her research on the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, reproduced the identity tags worn by 120,000 American citizens in the camps. And her wildlife project focused attention on the plight of wildlife and the impact of poaching. Here is Wendy Maruyama. Thank you, JG, for that great uh, introduction. It's a real honor to receive this recognition, and especially over the last 10 years or 15 years, I've gotten to know the James Renwick Alliance members, and, and that has really brought a lot of meaning to this award. And so for that, and for the friendship, I'm extremely grateful. So thank you very much. I'm ready for my slideshow. Um, I'm from San Diego, where I grew up. I identify myself as an Asian American woman with a hearing impairment and cerebral palsy. I am an artist and come to the field of craft with a fine art background. I started out as a metal worker, but migrated to furniture and woodworking. I think I was challenged by the idea that I could finally work in wood since it was prohibited in high school. I have always seen furniture as an art form first and a functional object second. This is a uh, Mickey Macintosh, which is a mashup between Charles Rennie Macintosh and Mickey Mouse. In the 80s, I was able to experiment with a wide range of materials and had the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of different artists over the years. As a woodworker, I tried to employ as many different techniques over the years as well and work for different scales. I found that exhibition opportunities often lead to a new body of work. I was invited to do a piece for a neon show in San Francisco. This led to another body of work that also employed neon, supported by a cabinet and legs. As a furniture maker, I always think about the kind of things that I would want or need in my own home. This was a tampon box for the bathroom. I was an artist in residence in France. And when I was visiting all the various chateaus, I was interested in all the furniture that was made specifically for women that lived in these homes. As a result, I made a series of uh, vanities that were large and small. This is a elliptic vanity called Shut Up and Kiss Me. This vanity is called Roses Are Blue. And it has glass tubes that you can put live flowers into. This is a full-size vanity set with a chair that could also be used as a writing desk. One of the things that I've always loved about making furniture is the duality of the exterior of a piece and the interior of a piece. Oftentimes, the interior can still be seen through the openings of the doors. This is the chest on chest with hand carved slats. My work has also been inspired by various artists and residencies that I've had over the years. I spent some time in England and studied the early arts and crafts furniture. And in the process, I was able to use different words from the area. This wall cabinet had English U veneer on the interior. While I was in England, I kind of developed a fondness for scotch 
and I made this cabinet that will hold two bottles of scotch and four scotch glasses and the word is English brown oak. A turning point for me was being able to have an artist in residency in Japan for the first time and here I am at Maoyama Park which is in Kyoto. The influence of Japan has most definitely set the standard for technical excellence in our craft areas. Speaking for myself as an Asian American, the general appreciation for Japan brings a level of pride of being somewhat associated by that culture through heritage. At the same time, it brought a conflicting sense of desire to also develop an independence from that culture as an American. And also there was the challenge of not wanting my work to look Japanese without proper credentials, quote unquote. I think one can appreciate and be inspired by a cultural influence. I think for myself, the use of colour helped me to embrace that appreciation while still maintaining some individuality in the form. I think Japan, like many other cultures, is a culture that is full of contradiction. Maybe I built this tea house to resolve my own conflicts about old Japan versus new Japan, and as well as my own identity. But the thing is, I grew up with Godzilla in the 1950s and 60s, so by that route, I feel a deep connection. I was invited to participate in an exhibition called Inspired by China that was at the Peabody Museum in Massachusetts. We were invited to look at the collection of Chinese furniture that was at the museum and design a piece that was inspired by the collection. I t took this opportunity to make yet another vanity and I incorporated a video. Uh, I wanted to um, address the issues of stereotypes and preconceived notions of Asian women. The actress in the video is actually my sister, who is a director and improv actress in Los Angeles. In 2008, I decided to do some research about Executive Order 906. My maternal grandparents and the family were forced out of their home in California in 1942. This had always been a very difficult topic for me to wrap my head around, but I decided that I needed to really force myself to look at the issues surrounding it. This is a photo of the Machida family before they were sent away. One of the markers of this period for me was the ID tag that all Japanese Americans had to wear before they were shipped off to the incarceration camp. This is a sample of one of the tags that each person had to wear. I was able to get a hold of an original tag and I took measurements and ordered tags to match the same size. This was the text that was on each tag with the name, 
and the student government number and the location of the camp that they had to go to. There's a national database online that listed every man, woman, and child that was imprisoned, 120,000 total. I wanted to replicate each tag as it was important for me to educate the public about this historic event. This became a community project. Hundreds of volunteers assisted with the project through various venues. We had pizza parties, we had groups at churches and temples, college classes, and high school classes. I also sent shoeboxes for to different families across the country that wanted to help. To accompany the tags, I also made a series of cabinet forms that were like dioramas, depicting the bleak landscape of these various incarceration camps. What moved me in my research about the camps was learning that many Japanese Americans resorted to craft and art making to help pass time. The bird that you see in this piece, called Street Bird, was made in one of the camps. This piece is about my grandmother who had a nervous breakdown during Executive Order 906. While they were packing things up to move, she ended up breaking or burning all of her family possessions like dishes, handmade dolls, and books. Ever since I was a child, I've always loved animals. And one of the things that has always been upsetting to me was the growing number of animals that are becoming extinct from the planet due to man most of the time. One of the early animals to become extinct was the Tasmanian tiger, and I made a shrine to this animal. In recent years, the elephant population has been decimated very rapidly by poaching and the demand for ivory. Um, this is a Buddha Dan, which is a shrine used by the Buddhist religion. This brought me back to the furniture form more directly. The wood was Clara Rana that came from a defunct rifle company, and all the wood had already been cut into the shape of rifle blanks. Here are some in-process photographs of large elephant masks that were made for an exhibition that I had at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. I wanted to think of a way to make a large object that didn't have the weight or the mass, so I developed a pattern of cutting smaller pieces of wood and them together. This is a photo of two of five masks that were completed. They were about eight feet long by about three and a half feet wide and it protruded from the wall about three feet. The pangolin is another critically endangered animal that is native to Asia and Africa. A group of artists went to Cambodia to work with traditional Rattan artists, and my friend Sylvie Rosenthal and Leo Starkgardner collaborated on a Rattan pangolin in 2017. They are being killed for their scales, so we had um, 
made the frame out of rattan, and then we had volunteers help make the stairs out of rattan. Here's a photo of many of the wonderful volunteers that we had helping us make the scales for our pangolin. This is the frame that was made entirely out of rattan. And this is the finished piece with all the scales that were placed on the frame by volunteers. As most of you know, the last couple of years have been especially challenging, especially on a personal front. In the last year or so, I've had several relatives become diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's, and so my latest body of work addresses the loss of memory or the alteration of memory as they remember it. This is a piece that I just finished uh, last month. It's a show and it's made a gold leaf and it's been painted in the back. It also has a black mirror that's removable. It's attached to the back with magnets. This is the detail, and you can see the texture on this particular mirror. My final piece has a long black lacquered mirror. But on the left side of the mirror, it is perfectly flat and reflective of the mirror. But as you move further to the right, the mirror becomes more and more distorted from the texture in the lacquer. There is a door on the left made of mica, and it only moves a couple of inches. It has no real function whatsoever. This is the reflection on the far right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Our next panelist is Preston Singletary, this year's Master of the Medium for Glass. His work is intimately connected to both the traditions of studio glass and his roots in Tlingit culture. He also has collaborated with other Native American, Maori, Hawaiian, and Australian Aboriginal artists as part of his effort to dispel the notion that native artists work best only in traditional materials. A solo exhibition, Raven and the Box of Daylight, will be coming to the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington in January, making him one of the few artists, possibly the only one, to have solo shows at both the New York and Washington branches of that museum. Here is Preston Singletary. Hello. Um, I'm uh, really honored to be here to receive this uh, recognition and award, and I'm humbled to, to be in the company of such uh, amazing, inspiring artists, you know, many of them learning about them all for the first time, and so it's been, you know, really wonderful to see, and um, so thank you so much. Let me start my uh, presentation here. So anyways, I, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background here. I grew up in the Seattle area. Um, I am uh, Clinkett, uh native from Southeast Alaska. Um, but I grew up in Seattle. My great grandmother, the uh, woman in the center here, uh, she was married uh, in an arranged marriage and, and had three children one of which was my grand, uh, grandmother. And she, uh, you know, so when she was, my great grandmother was widowed in 1919, she married this man named Dionisio Gubatayo, who was a Filipino man who uh, had traveled the world, ended up in Alaska. And uh, uh, they, they married and moved to the Seattle area. And so from that point forward, the whole family grew up in Seattle. And that's who I was exposed to uh, uh, 
uh, you know, the native culture, you know, with my aunties and uh, my mother. And so it, over time, I reconnected with my cultural roots, um, but not after starting as a glass blower. Um, so I am of the, the, the Kaguantan clan, Kilauea, uh, or the Kaguantan house group, the Kilauea clan, Eagle Moiety. Um, this is my wife from Sweden. I met her on a work trip uh, in 1993. And then we have two kids. Um, growing up in Seattle, my first passion, my first love was music. And I tried to make it as a musician um, while working as a glass blower, which I started in 1992 or 1982. Um, and uh, so I was always kind of juggling both the music and the glass. Um, and it kind of, they both, both of those creative mediums kind of fed each other in a lot of ways until I decided that I couldn't make it as a musician. So I, I wasn't going to be uh, appear on the cover of Rolling Stone. So I, I fell back on my art career. So uh, 1982, or 1980, May 18th, 1980, the uh, eruption of Mount St. Helens, I always like to say kind of fostered my glass career because uh, some of the artists, glass blowers took uh, the ash and uh, would melt it. And uh, the basis of glass is silica. So they created a lot of gift uh, items and Christmas balls and paperweights and things. So I got a job in this factory for about three years until I started to go to the Pilchuck Glass School. And then uh, in turn started to work uh, with this man, Benjamin Moore, who's on the, the, uh, the right-hand side of the screen. And uh, Benjamin was Dale Chihuly's right-hand man at the time. Um, and Benjamin had started to his own studio, which I worked at. And so we started to work with Lino Tali Pietra, um, the Italian master, and learning and working on incredible things and learning lots of techniques and so forth. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to create my own little niche with the glass material. And so I, I turned to my culture and, and so it, this was in about 1990 uh, or 80, or I'm oh, sorry, what was it? 1988, I started to dabble in it. And it wasn't until about 10 years later that I, I really said, okay, if I don't, um, you know, place myself on this path, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to get anywhere with it. So I, I started to reach out to artists and, uh, and teachers. And I came across uh, Joe David here, who has become one of my most important uh, mentors. And he uh, basically shared with me um, a lot. Uh, you know, we befriended each other and he introduced me to the sweat lodge. We worked, you know, we did the uh, uh, sweat lodge uh, process for 10 years together. And it really opened up my eyes to native spirituality. It, 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 and he also helped me uh, understand the, the uh, art style that I was um, working with uh, much more deeply. So um, what I'd like to call it is a genetic memory that I'm kind of bringing, uh, bringing out in my in my process and my work. Um, and so I really was uh, reinventing myself in a lot of ways. And I started to work with these forms that were, you know, these are, this is a, a glass blown object that is very typical of what you might try to make when you first start out. And yet, if you flip it upside down, it is a hat form, which is typically made out of uh, uh, basketry cedar bark or spruce root. And then, so I started to experiment. Uh, first, when I started at Pilchuck uh, in the late eighties, I was doing this sandblasting technique. And so I, I learned how to adapt that technique um, and to learn how to control the, 
the line and how to carve uh, out these designs. And so this is um, really kind of an exploration of, of uh, trying to make it look like tradition, look, make it look like, um, you know, but I'm also inspired by modern art. I'm, I'm inspired by primitivism and modernism. Um, a lot of this has, uh, these genres have a lot of really potent dialogue in terms of the, the inspiration behind where, you know, the modernists came from. And uh, so I, I find that really fascinating to, to be able to look at um, uh, the modernist work and become inspired by it. Um, and uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of these forms are um, in some cases, traditional forms. In some cases, they're more newer interpretations that are not traditional. Um, this is actually a collaboration with um, uh, Raven Sky River, who is, a, is also Plinkett, uh, but he is a very talented sculptor. And so he actually made this form. And then I created the design work that went on it. So um, that the the whale forms are really what he's known for but uh because we you know we hang out together and we're both you know contemporaries of glass uh community we started to work together and it uh having a lot of fun doing these forms um so these are really uh kind of a broad range of of just exploration of technique and form um Here's one that's kind of a, an obvious kind of nod to Calder. Uh, these, uh, again, just love, loving that, that, um, uh, that era of artwork. And see, you know, since I didn't, I didn't go to high school or I didn't go to college, I didn't go to art school. I basically just uh, learned through practical experience and interacting with the tribal community. Um, and also the broader indigenous art community from around the globe uh, to New Zealand and Australia. Um, and so these are, um, uh, this, is, this piece here is, uh, is a transforming, uh, a man that's transforming into a land otter. And this is a, a type of figure that you would find on the, uh, the prow of a canoe, a dugout canoe in Alaska. And this is sort of a guardian spirit. So it's kind of a uh, unique to that, that meaning there. Um, and this is uh, exploring different elements of cast glass and trying to create composition and, um, and working with glass in different ways. Um, so they're, they're poured into a mold, basically, these forms. They're first carved from wood and then made into a, uh, a steel mold that I can pour the glass into to create this composition. Um, this is a lost wax uh, casting process. So this is, um, is actually kind of an homage to the, um, the new hockey team that Seattle just acquired called the Kraken. So, <clears throat> um, this is the uh, ra little bit of a preview of the Raven in the Box of Daylight. This is an exhibition that came together um, as a result of working on uh, with an elder from Yakutat, whose name was Walter Porter, and he was a mythologist, and he helped me um, look a little deeper into the mythologies and uh, and kind of recognize the symbol symbolism within these mythologies. And Raven of the Box of Daylight was one of his um, uh, sort of key studies. Uh, he broke down several diff different Clinket stories and um, kind of showed the, the connectivity within all of them. Uh, but unfortunately he passed away before I was able, we were able to finish or realize the show together. Um, and so I found, a, had to look to find another curator. So I, I worked with Miranda Bellardi Lewis, who um, helped me, uh, who is also Clinkett, and she helped me uh, bring this 
show into uh, completion. Uh, it originated at the Museum of Glass in uh, Seattle, uh, Tacoma, Washington. And this is a story about Raven in the beginning of time, um, who is a white bird. And basically it, uh, the whole world is in darkness and he goes on this journey. He finds out about this old man who is, uh, has the, the daylight in his possession, in his clan house. And so he goes to the fisherman of the night and he's told about this old man um, and who has a daughter uh, who drinks from the river in the mornings. Uh, and so Raven decides to transform himself into a speck of dirt. And uh, she, she floats into her ladle um, but because of she is of, of high class um, within the culture, she, the, she has attendants who testing the purity of the water and they draw a feather through the water and they find this little speck of dirt, which is Raven. So they cast it out. The Raven has to reformulate his plan. Um, and so he transforms himself this time into a hem hemlock needle. And so this is how I kind of, you know, illustrated the, Raven kind of deconstructing himself. Um, this time he uh, she uh, he floats down the river and she scoops up the water and she swallows the the water and then now Raven is inside of her transforms into a human uh, child. So this is uh, the uh, the birthing scene where you've got the hybrid of uh, this humanoid Raven human figure. Um, and a lot of this uh, exhibition is uh, kind of animated with video and sound as well. So um, as you're passing through the exhibition, it's enhanced with different sort of uh, video that's moving and, and there's the clinket language that is superimposed with uh, the musical compositions that I created with my friends. Um, so on with the story, the uh, raven is now inside the clan house and here's the old man that's presiding over all of his treasures. And then eventually this child uh, who is very precocious and mischievous finds these boxes and one by one releases these elements into the sky. So you've got the box with the stars and then the moon and the sun. And uh, so what happens is raven, is tired of being in human form, he transforms back into a bird. And um, then he breaks, he places the sun in the sky and the, the daylight um, frightens the, the, the people. And some of them run off into the forest and then uh, become the forest animals. And some of them jump into the water. They become the sea life and some of them jump into the sky and they become the birds. And then the people that stood, um, unwittingly stayed where they were, or didn't, didn't react, became the human beings. And so these humans uh, eventually over time adopted these animal symbols to represent the families, um, family crests. And so, uh, so you have these figures here that are uh, representing the four different realms from the human realm to the, the forest, to the sky and the water. <clears throat> um, and then working with uh, one of my first uh, first mentors, uh, David uh, Svensson here, um, working on some large scale um, castings. This is uh, eventually going to be a, an eight foot uh, sculpture of killer whale totem. Um, my accomplishments are not my own, but those of many. And I think that that has, uh, it's a Maori proverb, which kind of talks about uh, the ancestral lineage that, you know, going from the ancients to the modern cultures, you know, contemporary into the next generation. Um, and so part of me feels like I'm just uh, the one that's doing this. I've been sort of recognized as a, uh, um, you know, with, with the medium of glass, I see glass as being a sort of a transformational 
material that can transform our cultures as well. And so by working with other indigenous people, I, um, I like to um, ex uh, expose people to the material of glass and kind of show what the, the possibilities are. Um, and, you know, of course the teamwork is something that's very key in uh, glass blowing. Um, and so I feel that that collective energy really goes into the piece with all of the uh, working with, with people. Um, and this is a, uh, this is uh, my musical project. I wanna just share a little bit with you. This is the other part of my artistic expression, as I mentioned. And uh, so I'm just going to show you some of the albums that we've created. Thank you, Preston. So, thank you very much. If you want to find anything, uh, find, out, find out more about the uh, uh, music or the glass, have that uh, those links there. Thank you, Preston. Yeah. Our next speaker is Consuelo Jimenez Underwood, this year's Master of the Medium for Fiber. She's the daughter of migrant agricultural workers, a Chicano mother, and a father of Huichol Indian descent. Her work reflects the interconnectedness of societies, insists on beauty and struggle, and celebrates seeing this world through her tricultural lens. It is centered on the border, sometimes depicted literally, and sometimes symbolically. In July 2022, a retrospective of her work will open at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. You'll also be able to see her work in Washington in the Renwick Gallery's 50th anniversary show in June, and in Subversive, Skilled, Sublime, scheduled to open at the Smithsonian American Art Museum next November. And an anthology of essays about her work will be published in May. Here is Consuelo Jimenez Underwood. Hello, my name is Consuelo Jimenez Underwood. And I'm very honored and pleased to be here. And I hope to uh, encourage all of us to be better people and uh, Take care of our nation and our land and our family. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Consuelo Jimenez Underwood, and I was born in Sacramento, California, many, many years ago. For fun, I would find newspapers or magazines and do a little draw on the white margins or the white areas of the advertisement. What got me interested in art? I believe that a line that refers to a sound or meaning has power. Like the cave paintings, an authentic mark is timeless. Powerful images can affect the world. By the late 60s, at the dawn of my third decade, everything wearable in my home was embroidered. Embroidery allowed me to enter the world of ancient anonymous maternal ancestors who for thousands of years have stitched the world together with beauty and functionality. Drawn and embroidered on my bell bottoms, I brought to life an image of a sun deity, which, when worn, purpose, determination, and empowerment strengthened my walk through academia. In the early 70s, I went shopping to the local Mercado in central downtown Los Angeles on Broadway. 
I was struck by the spirit and self-control exhuming from a group of young farm workers protesting the use of deadly pesticides in the fields of agricultural California. In spite of the jeers and heckling from the crowd, they stoically walked with pride, holding up the banner of the United Farm Workers Union, led by Cesar Chavez. Moved, I went home, remembered my dad, who wove and was undocumented, procured a wooden fixture frame, placed nail on the edges, and, voila, my first weaving, my version of a flag, a UFW banner. The black eagle is brown and soars up and down anywhere it wants to. I was very surprised when I saw how even and smooth my angles were. My, even my limited available palette was perfect. At the beginning of my fourth decade, I was armed with an art vocabulary and fiber skills, and most importantly for me, two papers. The Master of Arts from San Diego State, where form the object was emphasized, and I learned the textile arts. Soon after, I received a mighty fine artist degree from San Jose State, where I learned how to weave content and context into the object. With needle and thread and a couple of degrees, my voice was validated. I could now shout about the tricultural struggle in the southwestern borderlands. From the beginning, I vowed to make works that evoked or reflected the echo-based mystical socialism that surrounds us all. This is one of the first flags that I made after I graduated, and I call it the Frontera flag, which is now in the archives of the Museum of Art and Design in New York. It is six feet by nine feet. So it seems to me there are two empires, the English and the Spanish, and they are competing still for the right to develop America. I love the miniature format. Back in undergrad, I developed the habit of weaving a miniature a, miniature a day, honing my skills and dreaming up new methods and ideas. Three inch by five inch, the hoedown. Excuse me, let's not forget the indigenous folk who struggled to speak Spanish, let alone English. They, my father included, became the major workforce in the United States during World War II. I was born in Sacramento, California, after he met my mom in the mid-1940s. This work is two inch by one inch. Don Juan a Yaki wise man, said, if you hold the pebble, you hold the mountain. I tried it out. He was right. No matter how small, power exhumes greatness. How about decorative, prettiness, sweet? Does that distract from power? This is an 11 by 5 dyed silk slice of the American flag. What if we were to empower the true colors and triple extreme our view and understanding of the canton. For example, what if the stars exist in flower land, yet we can't see the flowers because they are too large or too small? What if we were to take this slice of the American flag and weave together fine silk and cotton bandanas with wire warp for tenacity and strength? Would the rich and poor get it, that together we can build a nation? And then Obama appears on the scene. How glorious and magnificent the flag draped in a triangle. He allowed me to see the beauty of the flag with a brand new shape. Who knew that weaving the triangle would be so much fun and challenging? This is a three inch by one inch. I even wove a large wire triangular flag that I entitled Consumer Flag. It is 10 feet by 18 inch with wire as warp and weft, woven with red bags from Target, white 
grocery bags and blue plastic bags from the New York Times. A studio shot. Most importantly, note the triangular quilted flag on your right. I overdyed my personal kitchen cloths with red and blue. The white embroidered stripes are tortilla cloths from my indigenous culture that is from Mexico. The idea was to embroider the southwestern border state flowers into the canton. The California poppy, the New Mexico yucca, the Arizona saguaro, and last but not least, the Texas blue bonnet all creating their own star constellations, one of my favorites. Who is the mother of the Americas? Guatlique. She wears as jewelry life and death. Her skirts are serpents swaying as she rocks. Not demure or shy, this lady has claws. She stands almost 18 feet high in the center of Mexico City's Anthropology Museum. It was at her temple when Don Juan had his vision of the roses and the Virgen de Guadalupe. And here Cuatlique reappears underneath the facade of nations and flags. Note the serpent skirt just below the navel area where the eagle and the serpent dwell. Her nails are to die for, almost sweet in their heart-shaped form. To achieve the distressed look, I ripped off the numerous white threads I had previously sewed. Sometimes in art, you must create to have something to say, to take away. I call this piece Quatliquelandia, and it's 15 inches high and maybe 12 inches across. Here's another quilt work, six feet by nine feet, and it's called One Nation Underground. For three years, I often found myself sewing red and white stripes onto a Mexican flag. I even machine embroidered the outlines of the four southern border state flowers. The flowers fortunately and unfortunately, live on both sides and are undocumented, almost invi invisible. This flag is woven, and I call it the home of the brave. Six feet by nine feet. Once again, the notion of the two nations getting along we almost got there in our generation of love, peace, and flowers. Like the vision of Black Elk, a Lakota holy man, he saw all the nations in the Americas united in one hoop. Please note, underneath, at the bottom, under the fringe, are replicas, contemporary fabric, woven in the manner of the pre-Columbian fabric of the Americas. His vision, Black Elk's vision, was further honored by the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. In their monumental Crafting America exhibition, juried by Glenn Adamson and Jen Paget. They placed the image of Black Elk's hoop on the cover of their catalog and by acquiring the work, ensuring this piece its place in history. There's a phenomenon that occurs in nature. In Texas, near the borderlands, flocks of the red-winged blackbird often fly over the border from Mexico undocumented. Invariably, a small group leaves the main group and flies down, slamming into the border fence. Many of them perish or are injured at impact. When they fall, at the end of the day, all is gone. Not even feathers can be seen.
I often wonder why they can why they do this. They can fly like the others over the fence onto green skies, flowers, critters, but they don't choose to. I call this piece Broken 13 Undocumented Birds, 7 feet by 6 feet. Very similar to the Buddhist monks, these birds never harm anyone or feel the need to destroy anything but themselves. The monks douse themselves with gasoline and set themselves on fire in the market square to protest the Vietnam War. Remember? So here are the new deals. Three ideas all shouting, me first, do me. Consuelo has to determine which one. Should I spotlight our nation in distress and create a new flag, faded glory, with stars emanating, shooting from the canton, with the faded red, white, and blue you see before you? Or should I address the ecological border issue, soaring, undocumented American eagle on the left? Or we pickers, undocumented border folk, where I visit the idea of what happens when there are no crops or people to pick them. They're just memories as we drive along the highway. Whichever I do, no worries. All is good in the thread hood. We have much work to do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Consuelo. We have just a little time for questions, and we have a couple in the chat, so we're going to just work through those at this point. Jamie Ann, would you like to take care of that? Sure, I'm happy to do that. And I'm going to invite um, all of our masters of the medium to rejoin us on, on stage here. I guess I can say on stage. <laughs> um, and Emily, I think you can help me with that, just inviting everyone up. OK. So we are over time, um, and this presentation will be recorded. So uh, if you have any concerns that you're missing something, we completely understand. But the questions, I think, are just too good to not ask. So we'll just keep on going here. Um, great. I think we have everyone now on screen. Thank you, guys. And thank you so much for your presentations. I think they were all very thoughtful. and. Uh, actually kind of overwhelming in a way. Um, I love that everyone's kind of trying to move move forward in, in a brighter light. So looking at our questions, um, there are a lot. Um, Diane Chernoff had asked one for you, David. Thank you for answering that in the chat. But it did, I think, kind of provoke another question which is about your experience in education or as educators. So of course, um, Wendy, you have been at San Diego State for a long time. Consuelo, you were at San Jose and David, you know, founding the program at the University of Arkansas. And then I know all of you have taught different workshops and things like that. So how do you think that affects your work <laughs> or inspires your work maybe? Can I try? Can I go at it? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, the inspiration is um, seeing the ideas and 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 possibilities uh, explode in 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 the eyes of those that I'm working with, and um, it's also extremely hopeful and it gives me a lot of fuel to go back to my studio and go. They got it. They're going to take it forward. They're going to run with this. It's going to be OK, Consuelo. Don't fret about the world. The young ones are coming up right behind you. So it's very um, exciting. And I feel like a fairy godmother in many ways and just bringing out my ideas so that the young ones can look at them, understand it, bring it to their world, and then proceed with that idea in, to another bigger, wider audience. So it's really, really good. And that's what inspires me to keep creating. It's the fact that there's people out there that are wanting to see this stuff, wanting to see my expressions. And especially the young people, because I think the young people I feel sorry for them. You know, we, we were gonna give them a great, incredible world, I thought, and uh, it's still a mess. So 
I'm sorry, youngers, but we did what we could and hopefully you guys can do better. And this is the kind of feeling I have when I work with anybody, young, older, whatever, it's and never too late. Mm -hmm. And Wendy, would you like to respond about um, your work in education? Oh, and just make sure you, there we go. I think if anything, it kind of helps to keep your pulse on what's going on in the most current sense of the word, uh, rather than become sort of like isolated and insulated in some bubble. Um, and then, of course, the challenges that students always bring. Um, they ask questions, well, why can't we do it this way? Why do we have to do it that way? And then you have to think, yeah, you know, it could be done that way. It's, you know, so, so I learned from that experience as much as they do. But the primary for workshops, I really love teaching with people in other mediums like glass and metal and because there's something to be learned about how they approach their material that you wouldn't think of if you're in your own little woodworking bubble. So I think to me that, that that's the valuable for my own work to be able to see what can be done. I think Preston, I a little bit about that. Um, go ahead, Preston. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I teach workshops and I've traveled to Japan to teach, uh, uh, you know, worked in Australia. But just, I mean, the whole idea of glass, you know, sharing glass blowing with, with others is, I mean, it's kind of, such an immediate medium you know you have you know you, you start and you finish you put it away it's well in case i have to take it home and <laughs> do a lot of extra work to it but um it's kind of like a spectator sport so it's really i mean i think that that's the nature of glass blowing is like you're sharing um i mean you can you can observe and watch and and, and uh, glean techniques off you know watching anybody work um, working collaboratively with people, you know, challenges me uh, to to think about it in much different ways. So that those are the ways that I like to um, kind of share and and uh, expose people to the material and uh, and learn as I'm doing it. Yeah, there was another question about narrative, and I think this was a really great observation that narrative exists in all of your works. Um, and respectively completely different, um, but consistent in the same way. So Sergey, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about narrative in your work and, and why that kind of has influenced your work or why you think you've kind of clung on to that. Well, maybe my cultural background where we're more uh, visual in narrative, um, and I think because I'm immigrant, maybe this helped me express myself too. So like moving hands or show objects has been really expressionist. Plus I remember in history of art, I really like it how in a, a Greek culture, everybody know myths. So I remember, I like this idea their objects come with narrative story and for, for example, if somebody come guests come to you and sit too long, you bring in them dish with story. If you sit too long, you know, <laughs> da, 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 like Winnie Pooh story. And I like this part, you put some narrative part in object. And same time, I really like it too, because it's just symbolical. You're not writing books. You just give image what possible be, um, uh, everybody read differently. So this is what I'm fascinated with. Yeah, and David, could you answer the same question about narrative and maybe how it's even evolved in your work? Yeah, I mean, I think my interest in narrative goes back to um, actually comic books. You know, as a kid, it's like I had difficulty reading and 
had somebody introduce comic books to me and the ability to tell stories through the pictures was something that just fascinated me and that really kind of stuck and, and planted a seed that some planted a seed that you know I think has inspired the work that I do now um, I think how it takes shape in the work that I'm doing is that I can use objects and forms in a symbolic way, uh, metaphoric way, um, to address some of the issues that I'm trying to fold into the work. And so, you know, where I was looking at those comic book characters and seeing the images tell a story, that's what I'm trying to do with the objects and forms that I'm working with and the pieces that I use, or the pieces that I make. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm actually, there's a few other ones. There's one about family and how family influences you, but I'm, I'm going to cut it off because we do want to get to your awards and we're 15 minutes over already. And Wendy's clock above her head is just reminding me of this, <laughs> um, kind of keeping us on track. So uh, Jay, I'm going to, yeah, it's there for all of us to see. Um, if other people have other questions, please email them. We're happy to get them to the Masters of the Medium. And JG, I'm going to invite you back on to um, give the awards. Thanks, Jamie Ann. And I do have the honor of formally announcing these outstanding artists at the 20, 2021 Masters of the Medium. We'd like to invite our symposium chair, Andrea Yurovich, along with our staff, board members, and friends to join us for a round of applause for these distinguished artists. Selected for their excellence in craftsmanship, influence on the medium and contributions to the field is my privilege, and it is a privilege, to bestow the 2021 Master of the Medium Award on David Harper Clements, Sergei Isipov, Wendy Mariyama, Preston Singletary, and Consuelo Jimenez Underwood. Congratulations. Can you all hold your awards up so everyone can see them? And so Jamie Ann can take a quick screenshot photo of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have one more bit of business. As part of our Craft Week celebration, we're holding an online auction to benefit JRA Craft. It includes great experiences and fine works of craft, and it closes in just a few hours. Um, we'd like to put a link in the chat so you can check it out, but if you don't see the link before we go, just go to JRA Craft and look for the auction. And now we've reached the end of today's program. I want to thank all of our Masters of the Medium for their presentations today and congratulate them again on their awards, which really are just an acknowledgement of the breadth and depth of their contributions to American art. I also want to thank all the people who made JR and Craft Week possible and who are responsible not just for today's program, but for all of our events. And thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us. Check frequently on JRA.org or follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at JRA Craft more information on programming and events. Goodbye, have a great day.